after the election then came transition and then the nomination. There was no transition. There was. Virtually. Okay, because you, you had a 3rd January declaration and then three days. And that's then. one of the things that we need to look at. We mm -hmm. need to come up with a presidential transition bill mm -hmm. so that from the time that we have elections, if there's the need for a second round, we would still have enough time, you know, for if, if government is passing over from one party to another, mm -hmm. for the two parties to engage and go through a proper transition. We had a very disorganized transition in the year 2001, and we had another disorganized, even more disorganized transition in uh, the current uh, transfer of power. And I think that is something that we need to deal with once and for all. Mm. The president's nominations then came up, um, nominations for ministerial appointment, and that's where um, the politics came back after the short break during the, during the, uh, the holidays. Yeah, your opponents uh, complained that the quality of the president's choices were not up to scratch. Uh, and then came the big voice of Light Left Hand Rollins, um, who said that the nominations uh, smacked of mediocrity. Uh, that was a, a very strong word to use. And, um, and um, you have said yesterday that the NDC has the human resource to see this country through the process. So quite clearly, Your Excellency, you are at variance with the views of of Jerry Rawlings. Uh, how can you convince us that the nominations were, 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 were top of the mark? Well, people might have, have their varying opinions about the nominations, but um, let me say first and foremost that they were approved by Parliament. Parliament has the right of prior approval of the nominees, and Parliament approved them. It means they are worthy of holding the positions uh, that they hold. But in a constitutional democracy, using the constitution that we have, the 1992 constitution, the president's hands are tied in terms of appointments. There's a formula for making those appointments. One, the majority of them must come from parliament. And so the majority of ministers must come from a pool of 230 people, potentially, as against 22 million people. It's actually lower than 230 because it's Majority is going to come from his party. Exactly. You get my point. So the president has a restriction in respect of where he can take those people for, from. Those people are voted by their people from the constituencies into parliament. And so majority of his ministers must come from that small segment of people. And then the rest he can appoint based on you know, his own uh, uh, choices. But then again, there's another uh, fiat. He has to exercise in making those appointments reasonable gender and regional balance. You get my point. And so every geographical region of this country must be adequately represented. And so when you take a formula like that, it's not like the president has a free choice to appoint people he wants based on what his criteria of merit is. And so for people who know the constitution, you understand, and know the basis on which these appointments are made. I'm very sad that they would say some of the things that they say. But mm. um, I think that in the critical sectors and the critical areas, we have some of the best human material that you can find in this country. In trade and industry, Hanatete, I don't think that you can follow that choice. In agriculture, Kwesi Ahoy, I don't think you can follow that choice. In economy, uh, uh, Dr. Dufo, I don't think you can follow that choice. So in several of the critical areas, there are several others that I could mention. I think that we have the human resource that uh, can move this country in the direction we want it to go. When do you estimate that this debt could be paid? Um, it will take some time. One of the things we're trying to do is to get a consortium of financial institutions to ring fence that debt, you understand, and refinance it. You're going to sell off the debt? Kind of. Mm -hmm. And so then we will pay it over a longer period. Mm -hmm. So if we could get a consortium of companies to take either parts of the debt or the whole debt and say, OK, look, we're going to um, kind of restructure this debt for you. Mm -hmm. Instead of it hanging as an albatross on the budget, mm -hmm. we'll spread it over this number of years at, this, at these terms, you understand? So we're looking for something like that. It's being worked on mm -hmm. so that it doesn't continue to serve as okay. a drag on the budget in terms of deficit. Well, that's quite interesting. Uh, looks like there's a lot of work ahead to be done. But uh, I'd like us to talk about your diplomatic uh, uh, forays since you became vice president. 
But just on the economy, you mentioned the NDC getting out of the IMF, and uh, and now we that we are told that we've gone back under the IMF program. Uh, we haven't yet gone under the IMF program. Mm -hmm. We are speaking with the IMF and the World Bank. But we are knocking on their doors. Um, well, I wouldn't describe it as knocking on. We are knocking on each other's door. They are knocking on our door too. I see. Ghana, <laughs> Ghana is quite an important country to the World Bank and IMF. And development so, analysts think that being out of the IMF may be better. Is that what's the government's view on that? The important thing is you need to finance the budget, mm -hmm. and so where are you raising money to finance the budget? If anybody can tell me where we can find the money to finance the budget, we will go there. The private market is close to us, virtually, because of the current uh, state of the uh, economic deficit, the current state of our reserves. And so we can't go floating anything on the uh, private market. And so who else? Friendly nations. Tell me where you Rich, have contacts. Rich people in Russia. 